Well, hi, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Yes. And I want to welcome you on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And we're just glad that you can join us for this time in God's Word. It's holy word. It's blessed word. It's precious it's word. It's precious word. Yes. yes. We're continuing on in our study of the seven letters to the churches, the seven churches, in the book of Revelation, and we're on the last one now, the letter to the church at Laodicea. And um, last, in our last session, we started in verse 14, yes. and we got into the middle of verse 18, and so that's where we'll pick it up today, And but before, before we do that, I'm going to ask Mark to ask God's blessing on our time together in the Word. Oh Lord, we thank you for your Word. And we just thank you for your son. Yes, Lord. And we just want you to open our eyes to what your word says tonight. And so we can spread your good news. Amen. Amen. Amen, Amen to that. Okay, as I said, we left off in verse 18. Yes. Oh, uh, and we're at that part of verse 18. Well, you know what, you're open to it. Why don't you read the whole verse 18? Okay. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. So, yeah, in the last part we talked about the, the riches, the gold, the buy gold refined by fire. So, what we're going to pick it up is, Jesus said, and buy from me, white garments, that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Mm. You know, in, in the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 25, it said, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Yes. Before the fall, there was no shame in nakedness, and that was good. Yes. God had looked at it and said, it's, you know, it's good. Then sin entered, and it goes on in Genesis 3, 7, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They weren't trying to hide their bodies. They were trying to hide their sin. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. All right? That makes sense. Yeah. And, and I'm going to say this, and you know, I'm not going to explain it, but I want to just plant this little seed. I think today a lot of people dress to hide their sin, to hide who they really are. Mm -hmm. So that, Because it does say that man judges by outward appearance. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to impress men with, the, with what they're wearing and how they look on the outside. Mm -hmm. But God searches the heart. So mm -hmm. that doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. For millennia thereafter, after the, the fall, nakedness was a shame. And it remains so until the time when people fall away from the faith. And then their consciences are seared, as Paul wrote to Timothy, and they believe that God does not see their nakedness, and they don't care. Mm -hmm. I mean, there seems today to be no shame in nakedness. Mm -hmm. right. So, one way that the world has tried to clothe or hide their nakedness is to proclaim not only that it's all right, but that it's good. To which I would remind them that it's written, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Isaiah 5, 20 and 21. In other words, what I'm saying is, today, it's like, instead of being ashamed of nakedness, they're boasting in it. Mm -hmm. They're calling it good. They're calling what's, what's evil and that good and what's good evil. So you get to the place... We're like in the Hans Christian Andersen fable. Oh, emperor's. The emperor's new clothes, right? Mm -hmm. Their nakedness becomes invisible to them. Right. Right. And they have no shame. That's the case here in Laodicea. 
when Jesus has to tell the church that they're naked. Right? right? He has to oh, tell right, them that. Right, right, right. So now, now that he has told them, their nakedness and their shame is exposed. Right. Now, <laughs> now, this is the last picture of a church in, in the New Testament, in the Bible. But this is not a new issue. Because way back, well, 750 years before the birth of Christ, God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and said, Your nakedness will be uncovered. Your shame also will be exposed. I will take vengeance and will not spare a man, our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. So God's saying, you can't hide. You can't hide from him. Your nakedness and your shame will be exposed. There are instances um, that are coming to my mind. One with David when he danced before the ark yes. when he was naked. And then Isaiah, I believe it was, God said yes. to, to walk for three days naked or something. And that's, three years. Three three years. This is a good point, but I, this is what I want to get to because it's this is what... Remember, the spiritual man appraises all things spiritually. The natural man does not accept, cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God for they're spiritually appraised. Right. I'm going to tell you something. David danced naked before the ark. He was clothed in robes, robes of righteousness. righteousness. Okay. He had on a garment of praise. That's right, yeah. You see? Yes. Yeah. I knew there had to be some praise. Okay, well, that's because right. this is... We, as the body of Christ, have to start appraising things spiritually, looking at things through the, the, the window of the Word. Okay? Mm -hmm. okay? So, here, the Church of Laodicea, what they truly lack, and the only garments that, that we should desire, are, go back to Isaiah, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Isaiah 61.10 God desires, and that's why he's saying to this, this assembly of people in Laodicea, to buy you know, garments of, of white. I just got a question. It says to buy gold. To buy garments and to buy ISAF. Yes. Buy with what? With, with their, we, I think we talked about this a little bit last week. Yes. The, the fact, the only thing is, because all of God's gifts are free gifts, okay? But remember we talked about you have to count the cost. Yes. And the cost is self-denial. The way we ended in our, la in our last study, as a matter of fact, I remember specifically because it, it really just blessed me talking about it. Because Paul talks about in the perilous last days, as he writes to Timothy, about how in those last days men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Those are things that the world offers that we need to consciously stay away from. So what you're buying them with is an offering of self. It is, you know, we're to present ourselves, Paul says in Romans 12, a living and holy sacrifice. That's the cost. The cost is us. Right, right. Okay? But it's a strange thing to have to pay because it's like what God's asking us is to give up all. Oh. Well, you know, I, I don't understand. Well, now, you know what? We'll go where the Spirit leads us. There was a rich young man that came to Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And he wanted eternal life. And Jesus said, all right, go sell all that you have and come follow me. And, and give to the poor. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. And yes. Get rid of all. But he was calling him to get rid of everything he had. Everything he had, right? Mm -hmm. And so was the cost of following Jesus everything he had? Jesus wasn't interested in taking what he had. What Jesus first said to that man was, one thing do you lack? Right. He was trying to give this man eternal life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what happens is, we, we've got our hands closing our pockets so tight that nothing can get in because we're afraid something will come out. Mm -hmm. And that's the case here. God's not trying to deprive us of anything in this, in this purchase. Right. He is trying to give us. But in order for him to have that room to give us, we've got to get rid of the things that stand in the way. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Well, let me talk about that a little bit. because uh, These white garments... 
You know, Sardis. I, I said the other day in our last study again, I said Sardis. There's nothing particularly that God has good to say about Sardis, mm -hmm. about that group of believers, mm -hmm. all right? He doesn't have anything bad to, to say about them, but not, nor does he have anything particularly good to say about them as a body. But he said to a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments yes. that they would walk with him in white. Mm -hmm. Right? That's in, in yes. so here in the same chapter, in, the verse, in verse four of chapter three, and it's a pure white. How pure is how pure are these white garments that we're talking? I got a white shirt on. Well, I know something. Put it next to the purity of the robes of righteousness that we're talking about here, and this would look very no. dull and dingy. <laughs> I promise you. <clears throat> Six days later, it says, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no fuller on earth can whiten him. Mark 9, verses 2 and 3. Fuller soap. Fuller. You know, mo most modern translations don't use that word fuller. Mm. That's because they're trying to make it easy to understand, and in so doing, they, they have they lost removed. the under, have removed, removed the understanding entirely. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because the word full is from the Anglo-Saxon word fullian, meaning to whiten. Mm -hmm. Okay? To full is to press or scour cloth in a mill. This art is one of great antiquity. It's mentioned as fuller's soap in Malachi 3.2 and of the fuller's field in 2 Kings 18.17. That, I just read, is from the Easton's 1897 Bible Dictionary. Okay? So they, back a hundred years ago, they had a pretty good idea of what this was about. See, making garments white is not about adding something to them, but removing what's not white. The spots. Right? The dirt. The spots. Those are the things that come from playing in the filth of the world. So making it full is not about putting something in, but rather removing something. So often we think that the fullness of life comes from having more stuff, more and more and more and more. Actually, the fullness of life comes from getting rid of the things that stand in the way of the spiritual fullness that God has already given us, right? So we can say like David, my cup runneth over, full to overflow. Can you, I mean, can you see that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Because he's coming back for a bride without a spot or a wrinkle, right? All right. So we're supposed to be wearing these white garments, which become more and more important as you go into the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. because that's what you want to be wearing in heaven, brother. You want to be wearing robes of righteousness. By the way, I don't think this is the place for it, but if you wanted to do a little interesting Bible study, go do a Bible study on, on what we would be clothed with, the garments of praise, okay, as I mentioned with David. You know, these robes of righteousness. The garments of salvation. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> All right. If you, I hope you can see that. Yes. If you can't see that, then remember the next part of this verse. He's telling the church here that they should buy eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Laodicea boasted in its famous medical school, one that was known throughout the land, particularly for its eye medicine. Remember, I was, we talked about this in the introduction to this letter, right? Think about this. When, when Jesus was crossing the Sea of Galilee with his disciples, after the miracle of feeding the 5,000, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you all know about the feeding of the yes. 5,000. Mm -hmm. Listen to this from, from the Gospel of Mark, Mark 8. They, his disciples, began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Mm -hmm. Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? They had just seen this incredible miracle. And now all of a sudden they're worried because they don't have bread. So he says you can't see because of the hardness of your heart. Mm -hmm. A hardened heart blinds the spirits of man. I'll state the very, very obvious. We are called to walk by faith not and sight. not by sight. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I do a seminar, and I've talked about this so often, because 
you know, I, I talk about God's plan for us to have success in life. When I talk about success in life, I'm not talking about a fat bank account. Yeah. I'm not no. talking about the wealth of the world. I'm not talking about the wealth of the world. God may give you, may not give you. I don't do not between you and him, but that's not what it's about. Success can only be measured by this one thing. That on the day that you come face to face with Jesus Christ, you hear these words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. If you don't, listen, Paul says you come into this world naked and you're going out the same way. You're not taking anything with you, all right? What matters is what you have stored ahead of you. What matters is what is waiting for you. And what should be waiting for you are those words, a greeting from the Lord Jesus Christ. So I talk about that and I say, well, you know, if you, if you go to the first chapter of Joshua, mm -hmm. you'll see literally a formula for success. And it is this, that you have a vision. Mm -hmm. Without a vision, people perish, right? Right. That you have the, attitude. the right attitude. Okay? He said, be strong and courageous. And that you be diligent. He said, only be careful to do according to all the word. And it says, and then you will have success. You're going to have success in everything. But the first one is vision. So to me, vision is about, well, I, I always use this phrase. Vision is the ability to see with your heart what you can't see with your eyes. It's faith. Yes. Now I want to tell you something. I am a skeptic. Yes. Now, That's not a bad thing. Well, it's not a bad thing if you understand what a skeptic truly is. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, in, in an essay from 1924, uh, Miguel de Anonimo said, A skeptic does not mean him who doubts, but him who investigates or researches, mm -hmm. as opposed to him who asserts and thinks that he has found. Right? Mm -hmm. What was that last part? Or okay. Right. A skeptic does not mean him who doubts, but him who investigates or researches, as opposed to him who asserts and thinks that he has found it. Right? Oh, okay. thanks. Well, that's kind of a roundabout way of saying what Paul stated so simply. Test all things mm -hmm. and hold fast that which is good. First mm -hmm. Thessalonians 5, right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to examine all things. You, you have to understand, given the fact that this present world lies in the power of the evil one, who is a liar by nature and the father of lies, that's what it says in 1 John 5, 19, yes. right? You would have to be pretty naive to accept things without testing them. Mm -hmm. And all too many people do, right? Let me say this. You cannot trust what you see. Particularly in this day and age. Absolutely. I have seen, I have seen mm -hmm. aliens attack the earth. <laughs> I've seen dinosaurs roam the land. Right. I've seen animals talk and elephants fly. <laughs> I've seen pictures of people who look much better than they look. <laughs> Can you say Photoshop? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Or you CG. You can't, you can't trust what you see. And, and that was more never, so, more that, so. Right. That was more never so. more true. Than today. it is That's today. Right. That's so true. Now, given that, if you understand something, if you understand what an optical, well, let me go back and just a half a step. Mm -hmm. Our God is God of power and might. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Satan has been disarmed. He has no power. He's been disarmed. That's right. What he is is a liar, right? So he has to operate on deceit. Now, optical illusions, some are just out and out lies. Mm -hmm. Some are just, well, let me, let me go into it. But given the fact that this world is in the power of the evil one, and he's a liar, I want to tell you something. Much of what you see, and less, like Mark prayed in the beginning, mm -hmm. and, and Paul prays that we, God opened the eyes of our hearts that we would see mm -hmm. wonderful things in his word, Right? An optical illusion is characterized by visually perceived images that differ from objective reality. Did you get that? The perception is not reality. The perception is not reality. I just wrote that's that's from the encyclopedia, right? That's a that's an encyclopedia definition of an optical illusion. 
it's, you perceive things that differ from objective reality. I want to show you an example, okay? So I have a little demonstration that will show how easily our eyes are deceived with an optical illusion. So I'm going to zoom right in here, and I have two cards here that I'm going to hold up. Uh, so you can see which one is bigger than the other, right? So which one is bigger? I'm sorry, what, what did you say? Which, which one is bigger, the red or the blue? I'm sorry, the, the red or the blue? Which one's bigger? The red or the blue? Well, as you may have guessed by now, they're actually exactly the same size. It is an optical illusion created by the way our eyes perceive things that allows us to think that one is larger than the other, when in fact they're exactly the same size. It's about the way you see things. It's about understanding that in the natural, it is easy to be deceived. I started to say, I, I, and I distracted myself, okay? God is a God of power and might. Satan, who has no power, mm -hmm. has to use optical illusions to see. What he uses, he's a magician. That's right. Right? By the way, magician comes from that word magi, who were the Babylonian priests, mm -hmm. okay? It's, they, have, they have the illusion of power, mm -hmm. but not the reality of power. And that's the concept of magic. It's the illusion of the power, right? So now it's a matter of can you discern? Discernment is supposed to be a gift of the Holy Spirit here. Can you discern the difference between the illusion and the reality? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm just thinking about this too, because when you see that, when you, when you show the, the two the cards, the two cards, you can sit there and say, I, I saw it. It's bigger. That one is bigger. Absolutely. There's no doubt in your mind. You saw it. And there's so many examples. By the way, I mean, you can go on the internet and just look up optical illusions. You'll see so many, so many examples of things that are just, it, it seems incredible that it's so easy for us to be deceived. Yes. And by the way, I mean, I, I understand, like, it's not a lie that one, let me go back to these cards just for a second that I was showing you. The reality is, it's the way that our eyes work. Yes. Okay, in this case, because we, our brain has a tendency, we look at something, we focus on the center of that thing. Mm -hmm. And in the center, this one is very much bigger than this. And now, it's still the same, all right? It's just the way, it's the way our eyes send information to our brains, which is why we're called not to walk by what we see, but by faith. Because our, what we see is untrustworthy. It's not reliable. It's not reliable. Uh, I mean, you can watch these magicians, and it's, it's it's amazing what they do. But it's all trickery. It's all smoke and mirrors. That's right. And you have to, you have to, but you have to know that, and you have to understand it. You know, in the book of Acts, there was Simon, the magician, and people said, this is the great power of God. Well, indeed, it was not the great power of God. Trickery. And Simon was the first to recognize that because when he saw real power, when he encountered the apostles yes. filled with the Holy Spirit, the filled with the power of God, he saw real power and he immediately recognized the difference. Yes. And he wanted to buy it, yes. That didn't bode well for him. Okay. When Syria went to war with Israel, mm -hmm. oh, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> well, I was going to say when. Yeah, right. Biblical okay. times okay. or modern times? No, now we're going back to the time of Elisha the prophet, yeah. right? I mean, hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. But Syria was at war with Israel. And the Syrian king sent an army to kill Elisha yes. the prophet. Mm -hmm. Because God was giving him information about the Syrian battle plans. Mm -hmm. And Elisha was passing it on to the king of Israel. So the Syrian king thinks there's a spy in his camp. And somebody says, no, there's a prophet of God there. And he says, where there? And they said, Dothan. So the Syrian king wants to do in Elisha, mm -hmm. the prophet. So he sends an army. Because I'm going to tell you, when the enemy goes after a man of God, filled with the Spirit of God, filled with the Word of God, he knows he better send an army. Okay? 
So what happens? Let me read it to you, okay? okay. This is from 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm going to read from verse, verses 14 through 17. Okay. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he, Elisha, answered and said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed. Now, you know what he didn't pray? He didn't pray, oh, God, save me. You know what he prayed? He prayed for his servant. He said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Mm -hmm. Elisha saw it. His servant did not. How can that be? Because I'm telling you, there are things happening in the spiritual realm. And unless you can see those things through the eyes of faith, you will never walk in the fullness, the triumph of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Elisha had seen what his servant had not. His, he had been blinded. Well, Elisha had not been blinded by fear. No, that's, that's, that's fear. the theory, yeah, that's which fear. is the opposite of faith. That's right? Right. It says in, in Psalms 19.8, The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Mm. God's word is a window into yeah. reality. Oh my goodness, yes. <clears throat> Write that one down. Mm -hmm. God's word is a window into reality. Everything else can be illusion. And when you trust in an illusion, I promise you, you will wind up disillusioned. That's right. yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Zipping right along. Revelation 3.19. Jesus says to the church here, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. God says, I rebuke and chasten. Now, that should not come as news to anybody who knows God's word. However, it probably was a shock to the church at Laodicea back then. And I know that it's a shock to the church at Laodicea today. today. They had probably been convinced that God would only ever bless them. Mm. That God wanted them to be rich in the natural. Mm. That the Lord never would do anything that, that they thought would hurt. Right. Mm. You know, when Job, who was a righteous man in the land of Uz, right? Says he was righteous. <clears throat> when Job was tribulated, <laughs> Undergoing tribulation. Undergoing tribulation, much better, yes. At the at the hands of the, of Satan, right? With God's permission, mm -hmm. his wife counseled him and said, Why don't you curse God and die? Oh. That's why it says, Thank God for an excellent wife who can find my sweet patootie. He God said, Don't harm. Job, and since the two became one, couldn't take a wife. And so he twisted her. Twisted her. Mm -hmm. But listen to what Job responded to his wife. Mm -hmm. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Mm -hmm. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Mm -hmm. Job 2.10. 2.10, not 2.10. So he's saying, shall I receive good and not be willing to receive adversity? Do you trust in God or don't you trust in God? Yes. Do you believe what Paul said when he said, God causes all things to work? 
Do you believe what Paul said when he when he wrote and said we exult in our tribulations? Do you believe what James said when he said we are considered all joy? There's a reason for that, okay? Now you can look at this what, what Job said. And think it. He said, it says in all this Job did not sin with his lips. Mm -hmm. What he said was right. Yes. It's true. Okay, so when I point that out to other people, well, they say, well, that's the Old Testament. Okie dokie. Let's have some New Testament. We just had the verse. <laughs> as, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Hebrews 12, 5 through 8. I don't know how you get around that. Now, I know that that makes a lot of people squirm and make a lot of uh, people try to get around it, but the simple fact of the matter is that is the Word of God. It's not about punishment, by the way. No. It's about discipleship. It's about being a son who is a disciple. It's about holiness and being trained in righteousness so you can wear those robes. Okay? Yes. Listen to this... Let me go on a couple of verses there in Hebrews chapter 12. For they discipline, talking about our natural parents, they discipline us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, Afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So discipline brings about these two results, holiness and righteousness. Amen. Should we not seek the discipline? David did. David sought God's discipline. Yeah, did he make mistakes? Oh my goodness, he made bigger mistakes than probably you have or, or I. And yet, you know what? He was ready to repent. He had a clean slate. The American and pretty much the rest of the Western world, the culture today teaches that discipline is harmful and it's child abuse. Remember that woe to him who calls evil good and good evil, right? Yes. In spite of the fact that that's in direct conflict with God's word. Because God's word says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Proverbs twenty-two fifteen. 15. As uh, one example, and many might be cringing right now at those words. If you are, be warned that if you're a disciple of Dr. Benjamin Spock rather than Jesus Christ... You're not going to like this. Spock, a pediatrician, wrote the, the, the common, sense, common Sense Book of Baby and Child Care. That was published in 1946. Now, if you're not aware of this, you know, it may be because of the separation of time, but I promise you it has an effect on the world that you live in today. As I say, that book was published right at the end of the Second World War. And it became one of the best-selling books of all time. Now, the opening line of that book, which was translated into around 40 languages, was this. Trust yourself. You know more than you think you do. Now, that is mm. quite distant from God's command not to lean on your own understanding. That's exactly what Spock wrote in 1946. That's the foundation, the opening line of this book that everything is, is built on. Trust yourself, okay? You know, okay? It's almost opposite. It's not, well, just, it it's not, not almost opposite. It is. It, is opposite. it is quite the opposite of God's Word. Look Magazine wrote in 1959 mm -hmm. 
And this is a quote, perhaps no other person has so influenced an entire nation's ideas about babies. His views have brought naturalness, common sense, reassurance, Sigmund Freud, and even joy to parents all over the world. Common sense. Okay, you can go into that one, too. Oh, well. Nat naturally, <laughs> natural, earthly, and demonic. demonic. yes. Life magazine in 1990 named Spock one of the most important people of the 20th century. In 1998, when Dr. Spock died, the New York Times, praising his writing on child rearing, noted that babies do not arrive with owner's manuals. But the next best thing was baby and child care. Now, let me just tell you something. They do come. They do come with, with um, owner's manuals, operating manuals. Yes. That's it right there. That is the manufacturer's handbook. It is the operating handbook for everything in your life. No marriage should start without getting a handbook. No child should be brought into this world without the parents receiving a handbook. It tells you how to live the fullness of life in Christ Jesus. Yes. The Bible is God's manual for parenting. And it's, had, it's been very effectively supplanted by Dr. Benjamin Spock's words. Among other things. Well, but... The child rearing. No, I, want, I want you to think about this because uh, you're too young to remember this. Yes. I mean that this was a foundational change in mankind. I mean that's why it says he's one of the most influential people mm -hmm. ever. Is because this. By the way, he repented that's of this. Enough. I want to say that yeah. just before he died because he said he was wrong. That's right. And you could have been raised by it because you were born right on at that cusp too. Yeah, I I think that I was not though. No. I mean, which, for which I give thanks to God. But, but this is one of the, I mean, one of the things that happened is I, I, a lot of social scientists, a, very, a lot of very knowledgeable people believe that Dr. Spock was opened the gates to the me generation in the 60s and the counterculture movement in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It, his book espoused a liberal, non-disciplinary approach to parenting that many commentators say helped create that counterculture of the 60s, all right, and the me generation. If you don't believe or understand this, go to any government high school in the United States or a shopping mall and listen to the conversation of America's youth today. In the United Kingdom, where we spend a lot of time, Go to any town center and watch the young girls unmarried and pushing young babies around in their prams. Baby carriages. Yeah, baby carriages, prams. I, I gotta remember. I have to remember to switch between English and American and American and English. Okay. I'll come back later and watch the young people coming out of the pubs and clubs in the early morning hours, falling drunk all over the streets. It is a plague in the yes. United Kingdom. Yes, it is. If you can't see the destruction of lives because of this undisciplined approach, this approach that has given birth to, I would suggest that you go to Jesus and buy ISAB mm. to anoint your eyes so that you may see. That's what I would suggest. Yes. He goes on to say, therefore be zealous and repent. Elijah, that mighty prophet of God, who James says was a man with a nature like ours, he had some power. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes, he, did. he prayed that, the, that yeah. God would hold the rain. It didn't rain for three and a half years, right? But Elijah was a man filled with a jealous zeal for God. That's what it says in 1 Kings 19.14. So now, speaking of the zeal of Jesus, when he had driven the money changers out of the temple, mm -hmm. the Greek word that's used in John's gospel is zealous. It's derived from the Greek word to boil. Mm -hmm. It's all about heat. It's all about fire. Zeal is that fire inside yeah, of you. Yes. Or to put it, and by the way, it says in Hebrews 12.29, uh -huh. our God is a consuming, consuming fire. fire. 
Another way to put that would be, our God is not lukewarm. And how can uh, what was the other thing that you said? How can how can how can God be so? How, oh, God is so cool. He really is. How can he be so cool and still be a consuming fire? It's a, nothing is impossible with God. All right. As always, the answer how to deal with this is is simple beyond belief. Repent. Repent. Therefore, be zealous and repent. The word repent presupposes that one has been told and been made aware of the fact that they're doing something wrong. Yes. Simple? Simple. But that doesn't sit well with the church of Laodicea today. Mm. Today is the age of self-esteem. Always, yes, always being told how good you are, uh, how good you're doing, what a winner you are, mm. And on and on ad nauseum. Mm. It is the gospel of an ear tickling church that takes offense at anything that's perceived as criticism. So let me just kind of close on these verses. Behold, how happy is the man whom God reproves. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Job 5.17 For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is a light. And reproofs for discipline are the way of life. Proverbs 6.23 Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. But he who hates reproof is stupid. Proverbs 12.1 Discipline, disciple. Mm -hmm. Disciple, discipline. You get the connection? You may not if you've been brainwashed with the word mentor. Oh, that's, oh. The great commandment at the end of the Gospel of Matthew is to go out into all the world and make disciples. Not mentor, by the way, comes from Greek mythology. He was a person in Greek mythology who was sent to counsel the king's son. The king's son. A counselor gives you advice and then it's up to you to take it or receive it or reject it. He has no authority. A disciple requires a master. Mm -hmm. And a master doesn't give you advice, he gives you commands. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Disciple, discipline. Mm -hmm. Discipline, disciple. Father, Thank help you, us Jesus. to love your discipline. Yes, help us, Lord God, to seek your discipline in our, in our lives. Lord, if that's what it takes for us to have holiness and righteousness, Lord, bring it to us. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man another. Lord, help us not to be afraid of rubbing against one another, to get rid of the dross that, that covers us. Help us, Lord God, to, to have eyes that can see through the eyes of faith. Help us, Lord, to see reality through the window of your word. Help us, Lord, to seek you in all that we do, in all that we are, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to deny ourselves, to die to ourselves, not to seek ourselves, Lord God. And help us to bring that word that encourages people to walk in that one path that leads to the true abundance of life. We praise you and thank you that you, Jesus, were willing to pay the price for our salvation. That horrible, horrible, horrible price. The cost of salvation is beyond our comprehension. But we thank you for it, Lord God. Lord, give us that ability by the power of your Spirit that dwells within us to lay down our lives, to serve you and to serve the people that you put before us. We just praise you and thank you, Lord, that you are our God in these perilous last days, that you have us in the palm of your hand where no man can snatch us out. Lord, that you put a hedge around us, that you are our rear guard and you go before us, Lord. We thank you for being our God and calling us to be your people. I praise you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, Father. Thank <laughs> you.
Well, we're glad that you're with us once again. Yes. And we're coming to a close here on this study of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. So be back with us next, next week, same time, same channel, same, same internet connection, <laughs> as we come to a conclusion. Yes. And uh, ass assuming I can get that far. <laughs> I don't... I don't think so. No, you got three no. verses. No way. <laughs> three verses. Right? He may be right. Okay. Pray for us. Yes. If you'd like us to pray for you, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We would love to connect with you. Yes. God bless you. And before we go, I know that my sweet patootie Alice wants to tell you. Jesus loves you. A lot. God bless you and goodbye. Be used for the glory of his name. Amen. Bye-bye. <laughs>